Well, a very warm welcome to you, one and all. Good evening, uh, wherever you are. I am Jo Love. I am one of the Wild Goose Resource Group and a close colleague of the man in the hot seat tonight, John. Hello, John Bell. Hello. Among Hello. whose uh, many current accolades has been the current holder of the Scottish Curtains Award for Zoom backgrounds. Yay. And we're here tonight, as you know, because hot off the press is John's newest book, The Long and the Short of It, Reflections on Reality in Different Measures. So here's how tonight will be, we hope. Uh, for the first half of our time together, I'm going to uh, put a few questions to John. He has no idea what I'm going to ask. And he has no idea what you are going to ask when it's your turn in the roughly second half of our time when you can ask some questions too. So before we could uh, begin, just could everyone check just the usual Zoom etiquette. Could you check you are muted, please, until it's your turn to speak? That would be great. And if from here on, if please folk could not use the chat function further. Um, I know there's been a few hellos and that's lovely, but it's a bit uh, distracting for us. So if we could not use the chat from here on, but when it comes to the open Q&A, you can chat and you can then, you know, get your microphones on when it's your turn. Thank you so much. Well, John, these longs and shorts are extremely varied in their theme and focus. But before we home in on any one of them, I'd like to delve, if I may, into the kind of behind the scenes story of you and your writing. So I pose this first question, especially in connection with thought for the day scripts. And I wonder if you could say something about your creative process. So between getting that invitation from the BBC and then actually getting to the studio or your computer screen on the given morning, what pattern or process do you go through in your preparation? <laughs> well, we're now speaking about historical reality because I've just written to the BBC withdrawing my uh, name from the team who do it, uh, partly because I haven't been used for a while, but also because I think that they need regional voices. And if they're not going to have my accent from Scotland, then if I can get somebody else, then that's well and good. The same with Wales and with uh, Northern Ireland and with the regions of Great Britain. I think it's been, it seems to be dominated by a kind of culture and mode. Oh, well, that's no answer to your question, Joe. Um, what you're expected to do is to uh, if, look at the news, preferably of the day before, which may have a bearing our conversation on the next day. And you then phone the, or uh, yeah, you phone the person who is your editor and say, I'd like to speak about this or that. And then she or he will say, that's fine, go ahead, or somebody's done that already, or in some uh, cases, that's a very sensitive issue because there's an election coming up or because a particular nationality doesn't like um, being talked about and thought for the day. So there's, there's a, you know, there's a kind of sensitivity, which I wouldn't have. And then you go and you prepare the script and you've got two uh, minutes and 40 seconds to fill in. The expectation is that you look at a piece of current news in the light of your understanding of the faith that you represent and hold. Mm. Now that doesn't always happen, but I think as much as possible, it's certainly been the thing that I've gone through. And so you get a first draft of a script and you might phone your editor and then down the line, read it to him or her or they might ask you to send the script down and they will peruse it. And then they get back to you to say, uh, the grammar isn't uh, what it could be, or, <laughs> or 
<laughs> the spelling's wrong, or uh, we don't think that this is cogent, uh, and and you know things like that, and not all at the same time. Very rarely they'll say this is this is fine, but but these are people who know how it sounds in a way that the writer doesn't know, and so they're judging it from the perspective of the person who's listening. So you then make corrections if you're asked to do that, and you send it back down, and then the the editor will send it to the person who's at the top of the tree. And he, as a he now, will give it a go-ahead, or he might make some comments. And then you, um, you're you told you can do it, and either during non-COVID time, go, at least I get a taxi into the studio early in the morning, do it live. But over the past two years, it's been recording it on my laptop and then sending it down. So that, that's the process. Mm, mm. So that that toing and froing uh, must be quite different from how you prepare other kinds of work because this book is not a collection of sermons, and John, you have a vocation in preaching. So I wonder if you could say something about what you see as the difference, or indeed any similarity, between preaching in public worship and delivering a talk such as the ones in this book? Well, um, it's a, uh, first of all, it's a different audience, you know, who, who've got breakfast in their face, you know, who've got egg or whatever. You can't even see it in the radio, but you know that that's happening. So you have to use a different kind of vocabulary. Uh, sometimes I would try at the beginning to say something which might kind of startle people a wee bit, so they'll listen because they're going to be shaving or been doing their makeup or whatever. You don't, you don't have that difficulty in churches. Very few people shave in churches. Uh, but also, you're not uh, allowed to make this a confessional kind of come to Jesus moment. Uh, that would be using the slot, which is about a religious perspective on current news to become overt evangelism. Whereas in preaching, um, you hope to illuminate a part of the scripture that people might be familiar with or unfamiliar with. You hope that the interpretation which you give might let people see more deeply into it. And you're ultimately hoping that, that there will be a, a commitment in people or a deeper commitment in people or a first time commitment and people to following Jesus and to believing in God. Yeah, so there are two, two different kind of objectives. Mm. You have inevitably in commenting on preaching in the church context, you've, you've touched on the scriptural aspect. Mm. And yet in these longs and shorts, you do reference the Bible and you do speak of Jesus. So obviously often knowing that your listeners might be of any faith or none and knowing even among Christians biblical literacy may be poor. So I wonder if you could say a bit about what are you trying to do in the explicit mention in more public broadcast of biblical people and events and quotations? Um. I would say this is, a, this is a, an overconscious thing, but I think that if there's a possibility in a public realm to be able to speak about faith and allow it, allow it to sound as if this is not a sanctimonious, um, pious moment, this is not a, a, hermetically, a hermetically sealed zone in which you talk about religious things, but I mean, it comes from a belief in the, in the incarnation that that God decides to end up in the vulnerable public place rather than the safe um, precincts of a, of a synagogue or a, or a church. And that kind of discourse uh, is something which I in a community has a long pedigree of, you know, George McLeod standing outside in Govan debating with people from the Communist Party. Uh, and I think that there haven't been maybe the same opportunities or, or the number of people who have that facility. Now, that's not my, you know, I'm not a, an auditor to stand and argue in public, but I think that if you've got the possibility of addressing people who don't normally go to church, then to be able to say a word for or about God and to do that in the context of other things which they immediately can relate to, 
rather than, you know, have a mask of piety and then we've gone from the world into the sacred space, which, I mean, Jesus came to kind of shatter the distance between the world and the sacred space. And, and it's the whole of creation that's subject to and accountable to God. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, let's take time to hear you read to us now. And in your first reading, we set side by side excerpts from a recent long and a short, both from just last year, 2021. Both are about women, or are they? Perhaps they are more about men. So the first is from a chapter called In Favour of a Black and Feminist Jesus. And the second is from a thought for the day which you gave, John, following the vigil for Sarah Everard. So could we hear you read? Thank you. This is, friends, this is the only thing that I knew Joe was going to ask me, uh, because I had to have the book in front of us. So this is uh, a part of the section on, on Jesus and women. And um, I mentioned that there are 22 women with whom Jesus has a direct association. And Luke's Gospel uniquely mentions 18 out of the 22, and he makes unique reference to 10 out of the 22. But it's a woman um, in John's Gospel that I home in on this section. And it's a woman caught in adultery, one of several women about whom there's a degree of sexual intrigue. This is not a woman whose sins Jesus forgives. Jesus actually forgives far fewer people in the Gospels than we imagine. There are just two, the call girl who washes his feet and the paralyzed man carried to Jesus by his friends. Now, this woman is allegedly caught in adultery, and I say allegedly because being a woman, her testimony would not be uh, valid. Jesus never asks about the details of the allegation. He never asks her if she's done what she's accused of. Instead, he asks the men if they have never done anything amiss. They claim she's a sinner, so he asks them if they've never sinned themselves and suggest that whoever is an innocent should fulfill the law by initiating the woman's death by stoning her. He doesn't specifically refer to sexual sin on the men's part, but in the context of this encounter, that is a possible implication. So the men walk away, the eldest first. Then Jesus asks, has no one condemned you? And she says, no. And he replies, neither do I condemn you. Now, is this because he's neutral to adultery? No. So what explains his lack of condemnation? Is it perhaps that knowing how biased the Jewish law was against women, that Jesus, re Jesus realized that she may have been compromised by the very men who, though shaking their heads as they walked away, might have been buttoning up their trousers not long before? It's interesting that when Jesus in more theoretical terms, fulfills the law. He specifically changes the understanding of the law against adultery. That law always worked in favor of men who from Adam onwards would blame the woman for being a seductress. You've heard it said, says Jesus, do not commit adultery. But I say to you, if a man, not a person or a woman, if a man looks at a woman with a lustful eye, he has already committed adultery with her in his heart. In other words, Jesus is less keen on having the law describe a sin which has already been committed than instilling an ethic of respect and self-control which prevents an adult, adulterous act from happening in the first place. So here the onus is not on the woman, but on man. And if we look... Um, uh, the language that Jesus uses, there's an amazing inclusiveness in which he allows women as much as men to know that they are made in the image of God. Now, here's just one example. It's a parable, and people will know it. He says at the end of the parable that the kingdom of God is, uh, in the, uh, sorry, that in the kingdom of God, God is like a shepherd 
who goes in search of a lost lamb, and when he finds it, he celebrates with a feast. And then a minute later, Jesus says that the kingdom of God is like a woman who goes in search of a lost coin, and when she finds it, she calls in her friends and they have a party. So why is it that we can see God depicted as a shepherd, but sometimes are reluctant to see God prefigured in the woman? Is it our upbringing, what we have heard or what we have read? Or is there a dormant sexual, sexist bias in the way we read scripture? If so, let's stop diminishing Jesus. To represent Jesus properly is a matter of justice to God and to each other. Well, the, as Joe said, the thought for the day from which I'll read just a part was following the vigil which was held for Sarah Everard and Clapham Common. Few people who saw pictures of women being manhandled by the police officers on Saturday night at Clapham Common can have been unaffected. Most people will have reacted viscerally with revulsion. On the one hand, we have women who felt it was right to attend a vigil. On the other hand, there were people, were the police, who believed it was right to uphold the law. Two wrongs don't make a right, but here are two rights which clearly don't make a wrong. It's understandable that in the heat of the moment, some might demand a change in leadership of the Met, and many more demand tighter laws prohibiting the molestation of women. I would love if there were a story in the Bible which pointed to a solution to this dilemma, but there is no such story. I've scanned the pages. What there is, however, is evidence that Jesus occasionally broke laws which prohibited the exercising of compassion. And the insight of Paul that all the laws in the world cannot legislate for goodness. I want to say that again. All the laws in the world cannot legislate for goodness. We're dealing here in Britain with what is a universal malady, namely the fact that men, and I know it's not all men, but the men have a propensity to use violence against women. Moreover, when they do so, women are somehow expected to be forbearing and even to take the blame. Recently, we've come to realize that legislation alone will not halt climate change. It requires us all to consciously analyze our behavior, question our assumptions, and recognize that the progress we want to see won't just come about through legislation, but also from the deliberate changes we make to the way we live. Nothing less is required of men in relation to how we treat women. Thank you those courageous words. John, I know from our other work blethers over the years, that one of the things that matters to you in the work you do is the question you ask yourself, will I learn from this? So I wonder if I could ask, what have you learned about men? or perhaps about yourself as a man through wrestling with and putting your mind to these issues like sexism and misogyny and the still imbalanced view of God through male imagery. So give us hope for mankind if you can. What have you learned? Well, I suppose I'd, you know, I'd have to start by saying that the culture I grew up in was full of suppositions of male superiority. And that got knocked in the head by, uh, mostly by always working with women. You know, my first boss when I worked in London was a woman. In fact, most of the people who worked in the social service office in which I were, were women. Now, I had never thought, I mean, I'd done a, wee, a job as a van boy and a boy at cutting grass for Kilmarnock uh, Parks Department. Uh, but I, you know, to have to 
ex deal with a woman as being in charge of you was something that, that was not uh, what I thought work was about. And then I grew to admire completely the woman who was the senior social worker in the office where I worked. She was a person of great integrity. But I also had another job working a, a children's, well, not a children's home, a home for delinquent boys. And in that, nearly all the women who were cleaners were Roman Catholics. And I used to have these conversations or be brought into these conversations with these women about their prayer life. You know, they're talking about, <laughs> one's called, was it Sheila, no, it wasn't Sheila Walsh, Myra Walsh. She said, oh, the priest says to me, don't come back until you've got something to confess. I'm fed up just listening to you, Blethern. And then she goes on to talk about doing the rosary and going to the church and doing the stations of the cross. And I thought, I have never, A, engaged in a conversation about prayer with anybody, and B, the last person I'd think of engaging in a prayer would be a, a Roman Catholic laywoman. So that, you know, that fairly early on when I was in my early 20s began to make me aware that, that the assumptions with which I had been reared, not consciously but by my mother and father, because they were, you know, they were kind of um, very egalitarian minded when it came to men and women. But the social, and, and, and also in the church and in a training uh, in theology, it was just a presumption. You know, we were told the educated man can do anything. That was a kind of arrogant thing. And I think some of us believed in it. It took a while for it to shift. And when I began to work uh, for the community, and all the time that I've been in the resource group, there's always been two women and two men until Graham died two years ago. And that... Uh, that forced me to look at the Bible in a different way. You know, because when there were, there were two, I mean, you're robust enough, but, but when Mary and Alison were there, goodness, you know, Mary they would say, well, that's maybe the way you read the Bible, but that's not the way we read the Bible. And, you know, she said with great, with great passion. And, and I thought, well, you know, if this is the case, I have to try to read the Bible through a woman's eyes. And if you believe, by which time I did, that God made male and female equally in God's image. Um, I think about eight years ago, I decided to read the Bible uh, for a year, but only read the chapters that had some mention of women. And then you find all these women that nobody has ever talked about. Courageous, brave, defiant, sophisticated, one a prophet and a judge and a poet. Why had I never become aware of that? And then you look in the New Testament and see the way in which Jesus deals with women in a far more even-handed way. It, it, you know, if, you put, if you have any conversation where Jesus is with men and women, the women always come out the better. You know, whether it's the call girl in the house of the, of the uh, Samaritan uh, no, the Samaritan, the um, the uh, Pharisee, Pharisee. Uh -huh, the Pharisee, or whether it's the poor widow and the rich men, mm. um, or whether it's the woman caught in adultery and the men who are accusing her, the, the person who, who always comes out as having, you know, more sense and sensibility and honesty, it's always the woman. And I am, in a way, ashamed that this has been eclipsed in the church. I mean, it's been eclipsed in society. But we have no right to represent the gospel to represent a partial gospel. And we've got no right as people who stand on a faith which goes away back to Abraham only to remember. I mean, you've got a hard time reading the Old Testament to find a guy who's not a bigamist, an adulterer, or a killer. You're telling your boy, you know, you should grow up and be like Samson. I mean, the boy's in that job. And, 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 and you know, Bill, David, you, I mean, you, I think you were, I don't know if you were a part of this conversation, Joe, but we've, we've uh, talked about the story of Jael, who's a great woman who puts a tent peg through a man's skull. It's a great story. And so, you know, when I, when I, I do this quite often with people, just tell the story. Did it up in Aberfeldy about two weeks ago, and people are shocked. 
And I'll say, well, why is this story in the Bible? Oh, no idea. It's terrible, you know. I would say, would you tell your, would you tell this story to children? Oh, certainly not, and certainly not to our daughters. And you say, but you tell the story of David killing Goliath, but you wouldn't tell the story of a woman who uses her wiles to get rid of the person who's the enemy of her people. <laughs> so, yes, I think about a change of life. I think it's been going on for about 30, 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you john for that wonderful rant thank you well i'm going to ask you now uh, to read to us again and for this second reading uh, we go to what's the the oldest chapter if you like in the book back to 2010 when one of your short thought for the days was developed into a green belt seminar um, the same year. And John, you say yourself that you have never had a more difficult public engagement before or since this one. And that it is as relevant today as 12 years ago, sadly. And that is because you spoke about child abuse. So I invite you now to read part of that talk. So I allude first of all to the, the thought for the day. Uh, in the middle of March of 2010, one of the current issues was a letter from the Pope to the Irish Roman Catholic Church. It came in the wake of a damning report by the Irish government, which indicated or which indicted the church for failing to deal properly with both victims and perpetrators of sexual abuse. So I decided to, to deal with the issue and prepared this script, of which I'll read a part. Just a glance at the Pope's pastoral letter to the church in Ireland is enough to confirm that it is lengthy, inclusive and detailed, an exceptional document, as several commentators have indicated. I think that if I were a priest in that church, I'd go down on my knees before my congregation and ask for forgiveness. And that not out of personal guilt. When an institution through its silence seems to condone child abuse, then all in leadership, including the innocent, realize that they have to share responsibility. Given the control which the church in Ireland has long held over education, the degree of potential contact between aberrant priests and innocent children has been considerable. However, it would be wrong to think that child abuse is a phenomenon specific to religious establishments. A university in the 1970s, I was elected president of the Students' Council, at a time when my university had no counselling service. One day, a 20-year-old student came into my office and asked if he could speak to me. He first told me that he felt called by God to the priesthood, and then he said that he wanted to admit to a sexual attraction to children. Why are you telling me this, I asked. Because, he said, I can't keep this secret any longer. It's too dangerous. I need to tell somebody, and I need to promise somebody that I will never, ever harm children. Well, what would you have done? I never knew his name. Had he said he was a sex offender, my response would have been clear. But this was different. He had somehow found the courage to admit to a potential he swore he would never pursue. Punishment after the event is not enough. Children will have been hurt. Yet we can't castrate or criminalize people who admit that there is within them a tendency they never wanted to be born with. Is it possible to affirm the potential for good that is in them while holding them accountable for ensuring that they are the only ones who will ever deal with their inner demons. Now, sometimes people write in response to thought for the day, not always politely. So I had one letter from an ardent Protestant who felt that I had not been bold enough in putting that in the boot as regards the Catholic Church. 
Another response came from a woman who accused me of being a rapist. By the nature of her very incoherent letter, I concluded that she had a serious history of abuse, which had left her severely psychologically scarred. There were also three letters, much more subdued in tone, which came from men, two of whom wrote with great appreciation that the issue had been given an airing. Both had similar stories. When they were in their early 20s, they had recognised that they had a dangerous sexual attraction to young children. They realised the criminality involved should they pursue their desires, and they knew intrinsically that this kind of activity was morally wrong in any circumstance. Both sought help and both found help. And both went on to get married, have a family, and never engage in any sexual way with children. One, a man now in his 70s, said that the awareness of his desire never went away, though its intensity diminished with time. Both were examples of men who acted on their self-awareness and thereby prevented untold suffering to children and to themselves. But there was another letter from a man who is, as subsequently discovered, now in his mid-30s. He wrote from the prison in which he's serving a 10-year sentence for child abuse. His letter was in some ways the most moving because he did not for a moment want sympathy or try to rationalize his behavior or say that he'd been wrongly convicted. He said very clearly that his sentence was just and justifiable because what he had done to a child was despicable. And then he commented that when he in his late teens realized that he was sexually attracted to young children he tried to seek help, but he was never given it. When he, in his late teens, realized he was sexually attracted to young children, he tried to seek help, but he was never given any. Thank you. John, my last question to you is not specific to that talk or that issue. But in this book, you state your belief that those who preach and speak publicly have no right to do so on easy matters unless also prepared to deal with what is difficult. As you've just proved, you do that. So my question is simply this. What is your best hope for this aspect of your work, this tackling the difficult issues? What do you most hope will come of it for those who listen, even for us here tonight? Your best hope? Well, I suppose it's really that that if people hear, not from a articulate intellectual and academic, or from somebody who's done a program on an issue, if somebody, if people hear it from a, a different perspective, um, that at least these issues might enter conversation. You know whether whether it's the issue of Black Lives Matter or whether it's the importance of women being seen as being equal uh, in the image of God and in significance to God, or, or whether it's, you know, sexual abuse with children, there's a, there is vocabulary there that we feel uncomfortable with. I mean, everybody's got that. I feel very uncomfortable with the language of technology. It's, it's not my kind of thing. But I'm, I don't run away from it. You know, I let other people carry on with it. I'll I, I, I add what I can. But there are some things where there is just a cloak of... We will not talk about this. Money is one of these things. Child sex abuse is another. The, the, the presence of people not of our faith in our communities is another. And, I mean... I, 
I, th I suppose it goes back to m my basic belief that but God is too big only to speak or to be revered within the Christian church or the Jewish faith. And that, and that because Christ comes, not to save Christians or Presbyterians or Catholics, but comes to, out of love for the world, to save the world, then these awkward issues, which are worldly issues, have to be given um, a hearing. But it's trying to make the transition from reserve vocabulary on the one hand and uh, apprehension about dealing with awkward issues on another, to, to try to get between that and to get between the, the kind of academic approach and the, and the other approach, which is just to the other extreme, which is to see these things as not our business or too dirty to deal with. It's, try, it's trying to find co a common ground where people can, not, can feel I've got a right to speak on this issue. And I remember, you know, I've, I think I've only spoken twice about child abuse in public, once at Greenbelt and once in a church in Liverpool. And at the end of this, you know, a very small gathering of people in, in Liverpool in a very poor area, and this, these two women come up and they said, don't think we, know, we don't know what you're talking about because we've had to deal with this in our families and elsewhere. And what they had found advantageous was that somebody else had said publicly what they thought privately but had never felt able to articulate. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. And I hope that those questions and hearing John's responses so far have been interesting and insightful uh, for us all. So now it is your turn, my dear friends out there, and Iona is going to give me a hand just to make sure I can see who's putting their hand up. If anyone has a comment or a question uh, for John, we've got about 20 minutes or so. We'll see how the time goes. Um, and if you can use, um, if you are technologically savvy and can use the, the little hand up um, icon from the reactions at the bottom of your screen, that would be really helpful so that I can notice who has their hand up. Although if you give a wave, um, Iona, I'll try to see it in the gallery. Um, so put your hand up sort of really close, then we'll, we'll try and see who's ready to ask. So who would like to put their own question to John? Oh, Jeannie Michael, if you're on mute. Yes, um, I, I want to say thank you very much for that. Um, um, my, I live here in Tarrytown in America, and my son, uh, this thing started with a, an elderly dentist, and my son spoke up, so things did not go too far. And... Um, uh, later on, we couldn't talk about it. Every, you know, I, I hardly ever talk about it. So I appreciate so much what was said. And I did think about this man later that uh, he's an excellent dentist, top 10 in Westchester and all, and family man. And I thought he would have never chosen this. It was my son, so I can't, it's hard to be charitable, but I was. And then I said to a social worker we were talking to, with my son present, that we did something. You know, we, we, we did something by coming forward. Um, and she said, oh, no, no, they, they just go right back. And I thought, oh, okay, thanks a lot. I thought Malcolm and I were gonna feel a little good that we did something. But, you know, there was nowhere for him to turn. You know, I mean, I think, Christians have to be aware of that. So anyway, I, I thank you very much for acknowledging all the sides of this. Thank you. Thank you, Jeannie. Yes, thank you. I, I didn't hear that all. It might be my machine. Uh, but I think I got the gist of, of what you were saying. I should say also that that, you know, I mentioned there the person who wrote to me who was imprisoned. He's still in prison. 
he might be. I, I mean, he wrote to me, and I wrote back, and we've had a we've now been writing to each other for about eight years. And he's he is a very changed, repentant person, a person of faith. And he's about to come out, perhaps in the next year or two. And for me, the concern is, it's awkward for anybody who comes out of prison, you know, when people say, well, what you've been doing last year or the year before, very awkward. And for him, it'll be particularly awkward if people ask what his offence was. And one just hopes that there might be places in the country and maybe churches in the country where people who have made reparation under the law and who have changed their lives might be valued and given a hand back into society. Because it'd be awful if this guy who's now about 40 might live to 90 and never have his full worth attested, but only be remembered for what he did wrong. Thank you. Do we have any other comments, questions? Got Nancy there, if you want to unmute. And then Linda. Yeah. I have a question, not on a specific topic. Um, but John, here in the, in the US, I'm finding within my clergy friends such uh, despair, uh, the weariness from the pandemic, but here it's so political and the rage, whether it's over guns or abortion or whatever. I'm wondering how do you, uh, how do you deal with your own um, emotions when you come at these hard issues? so that you can't speak so uh, calmly and forcefully. But how, how do you process, or, or you know, I'm, I'm assuming you have that, you have to process. Um, I, I can feel as I listen to your, to the ones you've read so far, just my own emotions bubbling up because you feel helpless. And, and making a right, making something so wrong better. Yeah, well, I, I don't deny that uh, I get mo emotionally involved, but I think that, I mean, and I think one has to own that, but I wouldn't try to impress people to take a line on an awkward issue through appealing just to their emotions or making an emotional statement myself uh, for which they, they, they feel moved. I think that, you know, in, communicate, in communication, one has to deal with factual information uh, as well as perspective or comment. And if possible, some kind of look towards the, towards the future. Um, and so, yeah, if, if some of these awkward things, I had to deal with my own emotional reaction, and then once you admit to it, then be able to speak. I think, it, but it's also for me important in speaking that I recognise that not everybody is going to agree for a moment with what I see, and that you're speaking to people who might have very profound prejudices. And therefore, to, to, to try to avoid feeling angry before I begin, you know, I, I, I remember one, <laughs> once, <laughs> I mean, the thing is, I made plenty of mistakes in the past. I think at one time I was, I was really, you know, fairly short tempered and very arrogant. And I think I did, you know, un unjustly criticize people who didn't agree with me. And that just gets nowhere. And I think it's always helpful to say, I know that not everyone will agree with me, but I have listened to what people who, who have an op opposing opinion have said, and I think I understand where they're coming from, but I'd like you to hear where I'm coming from and my, my opinion. And then people are, are not immediately excluded from the conversation, but rather they're, cannot, they're, they're, they're included into it. 
And, and you also know that, you know, some people will react because the information they have is different from yours. And some people react because the life experience they have is different from yours. Mm -hmm. And the more empathy I think one develops for people who are hostile or an issue of which you think we should be more generous or more compassionate, the more you feel or empathize with, with what may, might be the demons in their soul or, or some, you know, some a tyrant of a childhood minister or priest or of a, a parent who is totally unsympathetic to them. But you just, just bearing that in mind, I think, makes one try to speak a little more um, calmly. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. I can see three more hands up. Linda, Ron and Marilyn. So in that order, Linda, what's your comment or question? Uh, hello, and thank you so much for this time uh, with John. I live in South Texas, where I grew up in a uh, mostly German family. My mother was full-blooded German and ancestors came over on the boat in the 1800s. And the men in the family became ministers, pastors, ordained elders in the uh, United Methodist Church. I uh, was always drawn to that, but as a little girl, I needed to stay quiet and we don't do that and be a good girl. I ended up being uh, the highest ranking lay person, lay woman in the judicatory working uh, until I retired several years ago. Actually, well, I won't say why I retired. It wasn't a, it was a riff. At any rate, I was replaced with two male doctors and a female doctor, all clergy, uh, carrying my portfolio. Uh, I am now de-churched. Uh, I'm still faithful. And I am working with the Irish Jesuits out of Dublin uh, in sacred space, working their social media. And I love the work. I love the work that the Iona community has put forth into this world for in courageous ways. And I thank you for that. And I listen to it and I converse with it with people on airplanes. And we get into the most wonderful conversations about stuff we normally don't talk about. Perhaps it's because we're total strangers sitting with next door to one another in the, uh, on the airplane flight. Um, this is all a way of saying, yes, silence condones. And the, uh, the black women's uh, conference that I was sent to when I was still working in the judicatory I was the only white woman other than those who were organizing. I sat by myself in a row. I sat one seat in from the aisle. In other words, I left an empty seat by the aisle, listening to all the conversations and the presentations. And a person came and sat next to me. Then they introduced her she was the main speaker, the plenary speaker, and she was a black bishop. She had chosen me to sit next to. I learned so much at that conference about myself and my own uh, um, biases, perhaps. I came back to the conference where I worked and in the main plenary dining uh, uh, dinner, on the opening night of the conference, I was awarded the Martin Luther King Jr. Certificate for Inclusion. Now, that's not a brag. It's just that 
when they present when the bishop presented it to me i stood up and i thanked the people and i said you know i just got back from los angeles at a conference for women of color women clergy of color and i went as a lay person and i said i learned a new word or or phrase i said i learned there's something called white privilege and there were shouts from the back talk about angry shouts from some males in the audience as if to say shut up oh we don't want to hear that so i just share all of this to say i'm alive and well in south texas but very deeply connected to my irish roots and i thank you for letting me be a part of today's discussion thank you very much and <laughs> I, your accent has a uh, warmed my heart to the prospect of visiting Texas in about ten days' time. You can come any time. We'll love to have y'all. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. Ron Reed. Uh, thank you, John, for what you've uh, said this evening. There's a lot of very profound stuff in there, but I want to take you back to towards the beginning of your talk when you were talking about uh, thought for the day which among some quarters of course is not the most popular uh, of slots in the today program uh, every morning um, and i heard someone not so long ago and i can't remember who it was and i can't remember the context it was on radio 4 and he was talking about thought for the day um, and, and saying various things about it, how it was a waste of space and he was talking about the presenters and he said, and then there's that man from Iona uh, and sort of uh, left it at that with the implication that he, he thought you were almost a waste of space. Um, but what I was wondering was, you've told us about uh, how you approach your, your topics and you've told us why you feel it's the time to stop. But what motivated you to get into such a platform in the first place? Well, there was no motivation. No, no, I got asked. No. I mean, I, I, I didn't volunteer at all. Um, I had done some radio things uh, in Scotland, just for Radio Scotland years and years ago, even, you know, prayer for the, for the night. I mean, evening prayer, and I had done some television work in Scot in Scotland. I think until about nineteen, maybe nineteen ninety, we had a thing called Late Call, which was a a clergyman t speaking live on television, usually after half past ten for five minutes, and I'd done that. But that was all. No, I've never gone seeking work, um, and certainly not of that kind. So somebody uh, must have put my name forward. I was contacted by the then senior producer. She asked if I'd be interested. And I said, well, you'll need to test whether I'm, I'm worth it. So we did a kind of what you might call a dummy run. Um, she phoned me up and I decided on a topic and we did it as it would happen in a program. And after that, she said, oh, that's fine. Yeah, we'll, we'll have you. So that's, that's uh, how it came about. And of course, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an anomalous program. I don't know if there's any other national uh, broadcaster anywhere else in the world which has a, a two and a half minute slot where somebody gives a perspective from, from a religious point of view. Um, but, you know, every day you get, the, you, get, you get the racing results. You're told what horses you might back. Um, there, are, there are reports about the, the nation's finances and the stock exchange, which not everybody would understand. But I think that that it's, it's great that we still have a national broadcaster who has a place for religion in the middle of everything else because it's part of people's lives. And now that there are people from faiths other than the Christian faith who uh, make a contribution, yeah, it lets the nation know what other people who they might have another, never otherwise meet 
give a kind of insight into what makes Buddhists or Sikhs or Muslims tick. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, John. Marilyn, would you like um, to? Hi, John. I hope you've not um, covered this because I was late coming in. But it's something I wanted to ask you about thought for the day um, for a long time. And that is, um, you often seem to get asked to do one, uh, I mean, do a thought for the day, um, after there's been a, a, a great disaster or tragedy or something, and everybody's reeling from it. I suppose I sort of think of something like Dunblane. I think you did one for Dunblane, but something of that ilk. And I just wondered how much notice you get to, to, to do that sort of talk and how on earth you find the words to give a response when it's something that most people just can't even think about, let alone talk about. Does that make sense? Yes, I mean, it's, it kind of intrigues me as, as well. I mean, I think um, there, there was, uh, when I did the evening thing in, on BBC, it was the, the night there was a, a riot in Belgium with a whole lot of, of uh, a football match with a whole lot of, of players, of, of, um, of the, the, the opposing sides uh, injured in, in a huge fight. And then when the tsunami happened, it was... It was um, it was songs of praise that that for the phone to say could we have to do something about the tsunami? Could you come and and help us? So, well, it's not that I dwell in tragedy, but I do believe that when there is grief and bereavement, and that it's important that that it's not always the same things that people say. I mean, I think folk are get kind of fed up with the old nostrums. Every death, every grief, every tragedy is different. And I think the job of a communicator, as of a preacher, is to try not to put a different spin on things, but to try to find words which will be appropriate to the gamut of particular emotion which is expressed in any, any of these calamitous events. And you know, it might be because, you know, in the past that has worked once. That's maybe why I've been asked to do it at other times. But <laughs> I don't advertise myself as the tragedy uh, superintendent. But I'll tell you, it's a, it's a, it's a great privilege if that happens, and if the words can be found to be able to say something that that allows people still to hold on both to reality and and very often to hold on to God. I'm just put, I'm just put my back, see my back is burning down. I'm okay now, sorry. Don't let us lose you. Thank What's you. Up? Thanks Marilyn for that question and, and thanks John okay. for that response. I am seeing one more hand up and it's from Sarah. On you go. Hello, thank, thank you, you so much. much. I'm wondering, uh, thinking of thought for the day, have you seen changes over the years in terms of the censorship? So you said uh, that you had to send your draft to the producers and they would send it back. How much are your words changed or how much do they ask you to take out and could you tell us a bit about that? And I'm thinking particularly with the BBC and Israel-Palestine, but you may have other examples. <laughs> well, I did get into trouble about Israel-Palestine. It was like a major uh, upset. I mean, did, I don't want to go back into it because that's a long time, time ago. But I made some comments about a person I had met who was a, an Arab... Uh, no, he was a, a Palestinian Israeli, if that makes sense. And uh, I've met him in Canada, and he'd been in the Israel, Israel, <laughs> Israel army. A, a, a very interesting, interesting person. And I made some comments about what he'd said. And 
uh, within half an hour, there was a letter in the Director General's uh, box about what I'd said about the State of Israel. And then the papers got it, and then I was kind of taken off the air for about three months. But that's because uh, if, if you criticise Israel in a newspaper or on the television, you, you, you get lambasted by people who are Zionists, uh, who you know, pr presume automatically that you're against Israel and you've got no time for them and that you're anti-Semitic and everything else. I don't think you get that. Well, it used to be the case you got that with the South Africans when you said that it was a, apartheid was a cruel system, but the same kind of thing. But more recently, well, I mean, now I don't know if you said that whether you heard me saying, but I, I wrote my resignation letter today and it's all, it's a way. Um, more recently it's been, well, for example, there was a day when the government had decided that it was withdrawing the £20 supplement that was being given to people who were on universal credit. For people looking in from America, universal credit is a welfare payment which is paid to people who don't have a job. It's to cover their house, to cover their food, to cover them looking after their children. And because of COVID, uh, people were given £20 extra per week. That's about $30 extra. And then about maybe four months ago, the government withdrew this. So I thought, well, this is a this is a religious thing because you know the Bible isn't afraid to talk about money, and debt is something which which is seen throughout the Scripture as being a dishonourable thing if you inflict debt debt on people who can't pay it. So I did a piece which was to do with debt and uh, a scriptural basis, and they sent it to the editor, who said, "This is a great script." but it'll, it'll not go. You'll not be allowed to put it in the air. And the possibility would be that the government might have required or might have asked for the right to reply. I mean, I never dealt with government ministers. I wasn't saying that the chancellor was wrong or anything like that, but it was a bit of a hot potato. Now, I think behind this is the fact that the BBC uh, is aware that the present cultural secretary isn't exactly its best friend. And also that its licensing uh, responsibility, that the, the license under which it, operate, it operates is coming up for renewal in a couple of years. And I think they're playing fairly safe. But it's ironic that you could have, I mean, tonight I'll probably replay it, uh, dead ringers where people can make a fool of the government and you have comedians who will lambast the Prime Minister, bless his heart. Uh, but if some, somebody in thought for the day makes too overt a political comment, they're not allowed to make it. And maybe that's just that, that they like to preserve. I don't know. I mean, I, but they might want to preserve that there's a distinction between religion and the rest of human life. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Good question. Thanks, John. Friends, I am not seeing, Iona might be seeing if she's skimming through the gallery for me. I'm not seeing any other hands going up, are there any physical hands going up? We're not seeing any um, little icon hands going up. I've got nothing. That, sorry, are we okay? That may mean that having just got past the hour and this being a Zoom event, it may be that we're getting close to the moment that we're ready to wrap up for tonight. Thank you again for just being here, being with us and engaging with us. And thanks to Iona for looking after us behind the scenes. John, any last words? You know, well, I must say, it's been a delight to be interviewed by you. <laughs> and I think that if ever you leave the resource group, which I hope you won't, apply for a job in television. <laughs> I, the Ancient of Days from our retirement, will give you a good reference. <laughs> Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Well, we may not be able to hear uh, each other, but could we just show John our appreciation for his writing, for his uh, reading to us tonight, and for all his responses and sharing his insight, get to know him a bit better, and just for this gathering from all these places where, where we are. Thank you very much. Thank you, Iona. Thank you, John. Thank you. And Thank you. good night, everyone. God bless. <laughs>